hello. We're going to wait for one minute to allow participants to join, and then we will start. Hello and welcome to the Department of Energy's SBIR STTR Cybersecurity Webinar. This webinar is uh, recorded and we will post the recording along with a copy of the presentation on our website. We ask you to hold off on submitting questions and submit your questions after the presentation. We do so as we realize that a lot of your questions are answered through the presentation, and we want to make sure that we are getting your unique questions. Uh, please keep an eye on the chat box for information and the relevant links. And now we will start with Florence. Hello, thank you, Zina. Welcome to the SBIR and STTR Cybersecurity Due Diligence Q&A webinar. My name is Flo Carr, and I am the Cybersecurity Specialist Lead for this effort. I am accompanied by my other teammates, Richard Rosenblatt and Jonathan Jack. I will be starting off with a brief overview of the Cybersecurity Due Diligence Program. Next, I will define the SBIR and STTR, excuse me, cybersecurity requirement. And finally, we will spend the remaining time focused on the implementation of the cybersecurity requirement. Next slide, please. Why is there a cybersecurity requirement for SBIR and STTR awards? The answer to this question can be found under the SBIR and STTR Extension Act of 2022. Congress mandated federal agencies operating SBIR and STTR programs to implement a due diligence effort to assess the foreign security risks of small businesses applying for SBIR and CTR awards. So who does this requirement apply to? All phase two applicants and awardees will be required to submit a cybersecurity self-assessment. So what are the foreign security risks that will be assessed? There are four areas that will be reviewed and evaluated. The first three areas listed Patent, employee, and foreign ownership are analyzed and managed by a centralized source within DOE. However, the fourth area of foreign security risk that's reviewed and evaluated is the small business practices. This effort is managed and assessed by the Cybersecurity Due Diligence Program. The objective of the program um, is to ensure eligible SBIR and STTR small businesses have implemented cybersecurity best practices to protect against the unauthorized disclosure of sensitive information and intellectual property from foreign countries of concern, mainly China, North Korea, Iran, and Russia. In addition, this effort supports the reduction of risk to critical infrastructures. So how is due diligence conducted? Next slide, please. A cybersecurity self-assessment was developed to assess the business practices of SBIR and STTR small businesses. You can see a snapshot mm -hmm. of the cybersecurity self-assessment. And what on the slide here, the self-assessment consists of cybersecurity performance goals known as CPGs. Uh, they were developed by the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA. They're also aligned with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, excuse me, Technology, also known as NIST. The CPGs came from CIS's CPG checklist. 16 CPGs were selected, then prioritized, and the language was modified um, to reflect additional clarification and guidance for DOE, SBIR, STTR specific CPG requirements. 
Um, the self-assessment is structured as seen on the slide. Um, the, the CPG is clearly defined. Um, applicants and awardees will indicate if the requirement is fully implemented in progress, meaning efforts are ongoing to fully implement or not started. You will also see a rating for cost. This is an idea of how much money it would take to implement the CPG. Um, in this example, $2 signs indicates that this would be a moderate cost. Also, the impact and complexity ratings are also provided. Next slide, please. Here is the list of SBIR, STTR, CPGs that are required. Hopefully, most of you will have these already implemented. As mentioned er earlier, we will spend the majority of this presentation defining the CPG requirement and providing implementation guidance. So more to come later in the presentation. I just wanted to provide the, the required list up front. Next slide, please. Here are some helpful links. First one is a link to the applicant resource page where you can find the self-assessment to download and complete. The next link you will, will take you to the SBIR funding opportunity page where you can view the application submission date. The self-assessment should be submitted with your application by the application submission date found on this webpage. And lastly, the link to the cybersecurity due diligence program is also provided. We highly encourage applicants and awardees to visit our webpage for more information on the self-assessment, which can also be downloaded at this site. Um, also to, to view the cybersecurity training and educational resources. And then we'll also have the implementation guidance um, available on the webpage. I just want to also highlight a couple things. Uh, responses provided on the self-assessment are subject to audit per award terms and conditions. And we highly recommend all CPGs are fully implemented prior to application submission. Next slide, please. After the self-assessment is submitted, they are reviewed and a risk rating is assigned. Um, risk ratings, the risk ratings are provided to program managers as part of the, part of the selection process for an award. Um, the risk ratings will be also provided to the applicant as well. Um, the, as you can see, the risk ratings are low, medium, and high. They reflect the level of risk associated with the small business cybersecurity practices. Small businesses who rate high risk will not be recommended for an award. However, small businesses that rate low or medium risk will be recommended for an award. However, if selected for an award, they may have to provide additional mitigation. Next slide, please. What are critical CPGs? These are CPGs that have been identified as fundamental in the initial implementation of the CPGs. The purpose of implementing these CPGs first is to ensure that the appropriate scope is being addressed and the implementation plan is aligned to the small business's mission and objectives. We will take, for example, 2.L, Secure Sensitive Data CPG. All of the required CPGs actually support 2.L. However, to fully implement 2.L, that would require applicants and awardees to implement all of the CPGs. Instead, we have selected two of the CPGs, um, 2.E, which is separate user and privileged accounts, and 2.D, revoke credentials, and made them the requirement to fully implement uh, 2.0. L. By establishing privileged accounts, you're able to manage access to sensitive data and intellectual property. 2.0 L is 
the only CPG that requires implementing two CPGs. All other CPGs may be grouped together, but will have their own requirement for implementation. Our guidance will clearly define what is required to fully implement the CPGs. Another example of a critical CPG is asset inventory. This is a critical CPG since you must be able to identify your critical assets before applying the remaining CPGs. This ensures that small businesses have the appropriate scope before implementing the rest of the CPGs. All right, next slide, please. Okay. I get this question a lot. Does business size matter when implementing CPGs? The answer is yes. Implement implementation of the CPGs is not a one size fits all. Some small businesses will have limited resources and or the lack of cybersecurity knowledge experience. Uh, we have created implementation guidance to address this gap. For, for instance, the CPGs will require small businesses to implement processes to ensure the protection of sensitive information. I would expect that these processes are um, documented, maintained, implemented um, and disseminated within the small business. However, if a small business has multiple employees and assets to track, then I would expect to see a policy developed in addition to that documented process. Small businesses will have to determine the appropriate level of protection to ensure their intellectual property is protected. Taking into account factors such as number of employees, uh, assets, physical location of the intellectual property, and impact to the business, risk appetite, et cetera. On the slide here are some resources to help small businesses as they implement the CPGs. The first is the Global Cybersecurity Alliance website. This site provides um, cybersecurity training and a toolkit to help implement the CPGs. This site is used part it is used as part of our implementation guidance. So you will see us refer back to, to, to GCA a lot. We also have another slide that talks uh, a little bit more about GCA uh, later in the presentation. There are a lot, there's also lists of, uh, excuse me, The next is the NIST Cybersecurity Corner um, on this slide here. It's a great resource. Uh, the link helps small businesses understand cybersecurity and cybersecurity framework. There's a list of guides that can assist with implementing the CPGs as well. Um, the guides provide recommendations for multiple topics. Um, for instance, if you are interested in implementing remote work, there is a guide that provides steps on how to set uh, secure remote access and remote work. And then finally, you can see actually there's a CISA link on there as well. Um, we highly encourage applicants and awardees to sign up for the CISA alerts on the CISA website. Um, these alerts are really just reports from CISA they put out to assist small businesses with improving their cybersecurity posture. Lastly, um, is the link to our implementation guidance on our webpage. Next slide, please. Okay, here are some options that can assist small businesses when implementing the CPGs. Um, they are listed based on the complexity of implementing the CPGs. Uh, just want to be clear, we're not recommending any specific option, but only providing additional resources that can help. The first option, small businesses can implement the CPGs on their own. There is implementation guidance as stated earlier that can be used to implement CPGs. Some CPGs will require IT and cybersecurity experience. So if a small business lacks this experience or knowledge, they may want to exercise one of the other options uh, we will discuss next. 
So the second option is small businesses to can reach out to their IT or cloud service provider for assistance with implementing the CPGs. More than likely, you have the security feature to partially or fully implement um, some of the CPGs. However, just have to enable that feature. An example is if you if your team uses Google Workspace, um, you can set up multi-factor authentication by enabling this feature in your account settings. So if you have questions about that, you can reach out to um, Google or do a search and they'll provide instructions um, to you on how to do that. The third option you see here is um, small businesses can use a managed security service provider, an MSP, a third-party provider that is basically, uh, they manage and monitor uh, the small businesses sec system, security systems and devices. Or the other option there is they can um, also choose a managed service provider An MSP is used um, for small businesses that don't have IT departments, basically. Um, M MSP can provide IT infrastructure for small businesses. And finally, the fourth option is employing an expert in cybersecurity who can assess your business practices and provide recommendations on how to implement the CPGs. Those are the suggestions on how some small businesses can partially or fully implement the CPGs. Uh, Richard will now discuss the CPG requirements. Okay, thank you, Flo. Um, as Flo mentioned, we have a companion document. It's um, called the CPG Implementation Guidance. And I wanted to um, provide an overview of that and some, uh, some resources that we suggest uh, within there that Flo has mentioned. So quick... Um, quick overview of the CPG implementation guidance. Um, so uh, it's for all 16 CPGs and it's based on the documents and guidance from GCA, FTC, DHS, CISA, uh, the NIST uh, Cybersecurity Framework 2.0, quick start guide that Flo mentioned, uh, that is for small business. Um, however, the, the guidance that we provide uh, has been modified to address uh, SBIR, STTR, small businesses. Uh, and then, you know, there, there are specific sections that make up the implementation guidance. So when you, when you go in there, you'll see for each CPG, the format is, um, first we state the requirements, um, and, and we state it as, you know, what DOE, SBIR, STTR, uh, cybersecurity self-assessment requirement is being met. Uh, and that section um, identifies the applicable CPG and it displays the actual language that's found in the um, cybersecurity self-assessment. Um, yeah, once again, the language has been modified from the, CIS the CISA CPG checklist to reflect additional clarification guidance for the DOE-specific uh, SBI or STTR uh, requirements. Um, another section is um, what's, uh, what's required to implement the CPG. So this is kind of the, the nuts, nuts and bolts of the document, and it'll provide, uh, resources required to implement the CPG. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we do, uh, recommend and make use of the Global Cybersecurity, um, Alliance Toolkit, uh, or otherwise known as the GCA Toolkit, uh, to assist small businesses with implementation of the CPGs. So some uh, factors to consider um, when choosing how to implement the CPGs uh, are as followed. Um, these are some of them, not limited to everything. Um, review and identify your current business practices. Um, so that would include, you know, researching, collaborating with other stakeholders if needed. <clears throat> identify the uh, type of data used. Um, perhaps it's uh, Microsoft documents, Excel spreadsheets, et cetera. Identify the classification of the data. Is the data intellectual properties, sensitive information, such as uh, business financials or personal information? 
um, understanding accessibility to the information. So, you know, what users have access to the information and then identifying the uh, assets that process, store, or transmit the information, uh, including interconnections to other assets. Um, so as mentioned, the, the program uh, uses, uh, recommends the, the GCA toolkit um, to assist with implementation of these CPGs. Uh, a little bit about the toolkit, it's sponsored by the Public Internet Registry. Uh, it, it, again, it's recommended by the NIST Cybersecurity Framework 2.0 Small Business Quick, uh, Quick Start Guide. Um, and, and one thing too, we'll, we'll make this presentation available, but it's, it's got links to the GCA toolkit as well as the, uh, the CPG implementation guidance has links as well. Um, all right. And so, um, so the toolkit, which is free, by the way, can assist, um, small businesses with developing their asset inventory, which is very important and configuring, strengthening, protecting, and backing up um, its business, its devices and accounts. Um, the GCA Learning Portal has useful tools, training videos, and checklists that give a brief introduction of the threats, risks, and explains methods to implement cybersecurity best practices and the CPGs to ensure your small business is protected. Applicants and awardees are highly encouraged to sign up for the free account, review the documents, and as mentioned, videos, training presentations on the um, within the toolkit and the portal to understand how to implement CPGs. So I, I put up here, uh, you can see on screen, there's actually the, the screen to, to sign up. Um, we've got some navigation within the presentation here and then um, recommend that you first start off with, with the course that describes how to use the toolkit. So um, have those both up there in the presentation. Um, yeah, so it's it's a short uh, training when you go into that. Uh, again, all the tools are downloadable, include uh, checklists and guides. And then there's uh, other, uh, other available resources from uh, FTC, DHS, CISA, and NIST. Um, that are listed uh, to provide assistance within the CPG implementation guidance. All right, so now, uh, next slide, please. Now I'm going to actually move into the first uh, CPG. And, you know, format here really is, let's, we're gonna state the requirement that's on the self-assessment, uh, how the CPG relates to small business, why it's important. Uh, one thing we really wanna get across is, uh, you know, how this, impacts, you know, your business, um, you know, because that's really where this is most relatable. Uh, you know, we believe if you can, um, you know, if, if you can, if you can relate that to your current situation, this is going to, these performance goals are going to mean that much more. And then the last part of uh, what, what we'll be going over is um, how to actually implement the CPG. All right. So the first one here is organizational cybersecurity leadership, which is uh, 1B. And so how does this CPG relate to small business and why is it important? So the cybersecurity leader uh, provides for centralized responsibility. Uh, cybersecurity leader um, is responsible for the security, ensuring that there's someone focused on protecting the business from cyber threats. Cybersecurity leader also uh, provides a risk management. Um, they can provide prioritize and help with the implementation of CPGs to mitigate risk, balance the need for security within, and balance the need for security within the business's operational goals. Also provides for resource allocation. By understanding the specific needs of the business, a cybersecurity leader can ensure that resources are allocated efficiently, avoiding unnecessary expenditures while still maintaining robust security. They also uh, foster a security culture. So a cybersecurity leader can lead efforts to create a security work culture within the small business, providing training and resources to employees. A uh, cybersecurity leader promotes best practices in cybersecurity, ensuring that all employees understand their role in protecting the business. Uh, having a dedicated cybersecurity professional is crucial for ensuring the effectiveness of the information security manage of information security management and establishing cybersecurity training and culture at the organization level. Ultimately, this leadership role helps protect sensitive information 
and mitigates risk and maintains regulatory comp compliance. So how does a small business implement the CPG? Well, um, the small business should assign a leader who's responsible for cybersecurity within the organization and has developed a plan to fully implement uh, all the required CPGs. So to fully implement this CPG, the cybersecurity leader should develop a training plan on how to, on how the workforce will be trained. Excuse me one second. So, so just in summary, to fully implement the organizational cybersecurity leadership CPG, uh, the applicant already needs to assign a leader responsible for cybersecurity within the organization and has developed a plan to fully Im implement the CPG. Uh, to fully implement the basic cybersecurity uh, CPG, the cybersecurity leader should also document, maintain, and implement a training plan on how the workforce will be trained to support the protection of the small business computer systems data and um, personnel from cyber attacks. All right, um, next slide, please. All right, uh, so this is uh, each, for each one of these CPGs, we're going to have a training and resource uh, slide and lots of uh, useful resources that uh, we're gonna, that we put out here. Uh, we're not gonna go over them specifically, but yeah, this is a great reference. Um, it's in the deck, but won't we'll talk about it specifically uh, in this presentation. All right, next slide, please. All right, so uh, the next <coughs> the next CPG is um, basic cybersecurity training. Um, the requirement is uh, that small business workforce should be trained in cybersecurity and be able to support. Uh, cybersecurity best practices. So how does the CPG relate to small business and why is it important? Um, so so uh, basic cybersecurity training provides for an empowered workforce. Um, cybersecurity training fosters a culture of security within the organization where every employee understands their role in protecting the business. It also provides for collective, uh, fosters collective responsibility. It creates a sense of collective responsibility where security is viewed as everyone's responsibility, not just IT. Also promotes uh, for safe practices. Employees learn best practices, such as creating strong passwords, securely handling sensitive data, and email awareness, which can prevent breaches. One thing I wanna mention here is researchers from Stanford University and top cybersecurity, um, and a, a top cybersecurity organization found that 88% of all data breaches are caused by an employee mistake. Human error is very much the driving force behind an overwhelming majority of cyber security problems. And um, one thing we'll be doing as well as we go through these is we're gonna tr try to provide some real life examples. So a real life example um, about the importance of cybersecurity training uh, is a case with uh, U Ubiquity Networks. This is a major provider of networking equipment who suffered a breach that led to attackers gaining access to their cloud storage servers hosted by a third party provider. An insider later blew the whistle, revealing that Ubiquity had failed to implement basic cybersecurity practices that and that employees lacked essential training to recognize threats and uh, follow security protocols. All right, so. Um, okay. Let's see, so how uh, how do small businesses implement the CPG? So to implement uh, basic cybersecurity training, uh, develop, document, and disseminate within the organization a cybersecurity training program, which includes basic security concepts associated with the required CPGs, such as phishing, business email compromise, bas basic operational security, or otherwise known as OPSEC, and password security to foster an internal culture of cyber and uh, security and cyber awareness. Uh, new employees should receive initial cybersecurity training within 10 days of onboarding and reoccurring training uh, should be done at least on an annual basis. All right, next slide, please. 
All right, once again, uh, for basic cybersecurity training here, we have training and resources. Um, so uh, this, again, this will be available um, for folks to use for reference. All right, next slide, please. All right, our next CPG is asset inventory. And the requirement is the small business should create an asset inventory to identify authorized and unauthorized use of any digital service or device, an unmanaged or managed asset that is not formally approved and supported by the IT department and rapidly detect and respond to new vulnerabilities. So how does this CPG relate to small business? Well, um, having an asset inventory provides for visibility and control. An asset inventory provides a clear picture of all the hardware, software, and data assets the business owns, allowing for better management. Also for risk management purposes, knowing what assets you have helps in identifying which ones are critical and may be vulnerable to cyber threats. For recovery planning as well, having an asset inventory aids in developing and executing recovery plans by knowing exactly what needs to be restored or replaced. Also for audit readiness, an accurate asset inventory ensures the business is prepared for audits, reducing the risk of compliance issues. In summary, developing and maintaining a comprehensive asset inventory is crucial for effective system management and security. It helps organizations identify and keep track of their high value assets, understand system vulnerabilities, system users and owners, system connections, and helps the organization understand the various data types the company is employing, which ensures accountability. So another example I want to provide here is uh, with Equifax. Many of you may know this is a, a large credit reporting agency. Well, they suffered a massive data breach that exposed personal information, such as social security numbers, birth dates, and address and, and addresses. The breach occurred due to a vulnerability in Apache Struts, a web application framework. The, the vulnerability had been publicly disclosed and a patch was available for months before the attack. However, Equifax failed to apply the patch in time, leaving its systems vulnerable to attack. Had Equifax kept an accurate inventory and checked it weekly, they would have noticed that patches hadn't been applied. Right, so how do we implement this? So to fully implement uh, asset inventory, uh, applicants and awardees should develop, document, maintain, and share with stakeholders an asset inventory that will be used to assist, um, that will be used to identify authorized and unauthorized use of any digital service or device that is approved and managed by the IT uh, department. Um, all right, some additional uh, requirements there too to implement the CPG. Um, yeah, this this one will take a bit of time to implement because um, the amount of research and detail required. However, if implemented properly, the small business will have a centralized repo repository of all assets, which promotes a more efficient and effective way to protect against cyber attacks, such as the unauthorized disclosure of sensitive information and intellectual property. To fully implement the CPG, a couple other things here. Um, we, uh, we do recommend registering um, and logging into the GCA portal and view the free training presentation, how to inventory your devices, apps, and accounts. Also download and complete the Know What You Have checklist to learn what assets need to be identified, document, and maintain within your business. Understand the data you're processing, storing, and transferring to help your workforce identify, classify, and label sensitive data and intellectual property, download and complete the classification policy template. Um, after the free training and internal research is completed, um, then create your asset inventory by completing the uh, CIS hardware and software asset training spreadsheet uh, for, all assets, uh, for all assets. And this is found on the GCA learning portal. Uh, document and track any devices that are managed or not managed by your small business. And then uh, download the GCA asset inventory and device management policy template for assistance with developing and documenting an asset management policy. Uh, Flo mentioned policies earlier, so just wanted to hit on one of those here. Um, if needed, the uh, DHS CRR supplemental resource guide asset for asset management 
uh, has more on developing an asset management uh, process and policy, uh, which aligns with um, with our CPG here. All right, next slide, please. All right, so once again, here's some uh, resources for asset inventory. Um, just want to put that out there. All right, our next CPG here is uh, 2A, changing default passwords. And the requirement is the small business should prevent threat actors from using default passwords to achieve, achieve initial access or to move laterally in a network. So how does the CPG relate to small business and why is it important? Well, firstly, um, changing default passwords reduces vulnerabilities. Default passwords are widely known and easily accessible, making devices or accounts with unchanged passwords vulnerable to attacks. So changing them reduces the risk significantly. Also limits the attacking surface. Changing default passwords minimizes the chances of attackers exploiting weak entry points. And lastly, this provides for immediate protections. Changing default passwords provides immediate protection against one of the most common security weaknesses, making this a quick win for small businesses. All right. Uh, one example here is uh, for printers. Uh, this is a device which may seem harmless, but when connected to a network, there can be dire consequences of not changing default passwords. In most cases, the device ships with a, a default username and password, which is publicly available. Changing the default password is an incredibly easy task, but if not changed, this opens a company up or individual to immediate attack. Once authenticated attackers can access the configuration page as administrator, allowing them to perform malicious tasks throughout a company's network. All right, so to fully implement um, default passwords, uh, applicant awardees should create, document, and implement a process to change default passwords on all systems, software, and services identified in your asset inventory. Uh, the process should also be disseminated to all stakeholders. All right, um, <clears throat> let's go to the next slide. <laughs> so we got we have some uh, training and resources for default passwords here. And then let's move on to the next slide, please, which is uh, secure sensitive data. Right, so the requirement is the small business should protect sensitive information from unauthorized access. Um, how does the cyber, how does the CPG relate to small business and why is it important? Okay, the CPG protects business integrity, uh, securing, uh, securing sensitive data such as financial records, intellectual property and other information is essential to maintaining the confidentiality and integrity of the business. Also for reputation management. A breach of sensitive data can severely damage a business's reputation. Securing data helps avoid the negative publicity and loss of customer confidence that can result from such incidents. Also for preventing uh, financial loss, data breaches can lead to significant financial losses through threat, theft, fraud, or ransom demands. I wanna provide another example here. In 2015, Anthem Incorporated was breached, <clears throat> excuse me, exposing the personal data of 78.8 million people. Hackers accused, ha hackers accessed unencrypted sensitive data after a phishing attack. The lack of full disk encryption made it easier for attackers to steal information. Anthem faces six, 16, million HIPAA fine, $16 million HIPAA fine and significant reputational damage. The incident underscored the need for encryption, better access controls and phishing prevention. Right. So how does a how does how does a small business implement this CPG? Uh, ultimately, the goal of implementing all CPGs is to secure sensitive data, which would include information, intellectual property, of small businesses from unauthorized disclosure. However, as part of implementing this critical requirement, uh, which is secure sensitive data, small businesses should implement. Um, both 2E, separating user and privilege accounts, and 2D, revoke credentials, which will be discussed shortly. 
develop an access management policy, documenting the process of restricting access to sensitive information and intellectual property to authorized users, separate user and privilege accounts and revoke credentials. And uh, we'll also be discussing revoke credentials next too. The policy should include, but is not limited to, identifying uh, who are assigned users and who has privilege accounts, along with their roles and responsibilities, a process for how to establish and enforce separation of duties, a process of how privileged user accounts are created and managed, a process of creating and disabling accounts for new temporary departing and departed employees, and that's part of um, revoke credentials, which we'll talk about, identifying who's responsible for disabling accounts and revoking credentials for departing and terminating employees, and a process to delete disable accounts, and a process if privileged accounts are compromised. And lastly, a process on how remote access is established and managed. Next slide, please. All right, once again, here's some training and resources uh, for secure sensitive data. All right, let's move on to separating. Next slide, please. Let's move on to separating user and privileged accounts. And the requirement is the small business should make it harder for threat actors to gain access to administrator or privileged accounts even if common user accounts are compromised. So how does the CPG relate to small business and why is it important? Well, separating user and privileged accounts uh, limits access. By separating user accounts uh, and privileged accounts, the business limits access to critical systems and sensitive data, reducing the risk of unauthorized changes or data breaches. This also mitigates insider threats. The separation ensures that even if a regular user account is compromised, the attacker cannot gain access to privileged functions, thereby mitigating the risk of insider threats. This also prevents mistakes. Privileged accounts have higher access levels and can make significant changes to systems and data. By limiting the use of these accounts to specific administrative tasks, the risk of accidental errors, such as deleting important files or misconfiguring settings, is reduced. This also provides for better forensics. Separating accounts enables better tracking and forensics and is easier to identify which actors, which actions were performed by regular users versus administrators during an investigation. And we have another uh, example here. Uh, Sony Pictures uh, suffered a cyber attack in which hackers stole and leaked sensitive data. They managed to do this by gaining access to Sony's internal network, eventually es escalating their privileges to highly uh, excuse me, eventually escalating their privileges to highly sensitive systems. Sony's network lacked proper segregation between regular and user accounts and privileged accounts and allowed the attackers to move laterally across the network and compromise critical systems. All right, so um, how, do, how do small businesses implement this CPG? Uh, the small business should decide on what type of access, con access control model best meets their mission. Some factors to consider when deciding on an access control model are thinking about the level of access for employees. Are there different levels of access required or is everyone on the same level? Is there sensitive information or intellectual property that should not be available for all to view? Next, uh, determine who needs access and what level of access is required. And finally, identify uh, critical assets that need to be protected, systems and devices that store sensitive data, like financial and personal data and intellectual property. We recommend using the GC access management policy template to document how access to sensitive data and intellectual property is managed on assets, resources, services, and facilities. Lastly, define and maintain role-based access control through determining and documenting the access rights necessary for each role within the business to successfully carry out its assigned duties. The business should perform access control reviews of business assets to validate that all privileges are authorized on a recurring schedule and at a minimum annually or more frequently. All right, uh, next slide, please. All right, here's some training and resources uh, written in reference to the GCA toolkit for separating user and privileged accounts. All right, our next CPG. Um, is revoke credentials. Um, so how does this, uh, let me actually first read the requirement. Small business should prevent unauthorized access to organizational accounts or resources by former employees. 
It's a requirement. How does the CPG relate to small business and why is it important? Uh, well, revoking credentials um, reduces risk of malicious actions. A disgruntled former employee could attempt to harm the business by using their old credentials. Revoking access immediately upon departure mitigates this insider threat. Also ensures smooth transitions. By revoking access, the business can more easily transition responsibilities to other employees, ensuring that critical tasks and data remain secure, secure during staff changes. This also facilitates investigations. In the event of a security incident, knowing that credentials of former employees have been revoked can help narrow down potential sources of unauthorized access, aiding in quicker resolutions. And we do have an example here, um, a fired employee at a Singapore-based company called NCS accessed the company's computer test system and deleted servers, causing the company to lose $678,000. The fired employee deleted 180 virtual servers. He accessed NCS's QA system 13 times before being caught. A fired employee was sentenced to two years and eight months jail time for one charge of unauthorized access to computer material. Had the fire employee's access credentials been revoked at the time of his employment, this situation would never have occurred. So revoking credentials for departing employees is critical for maintaining security and preventing unauthorized access. It helps protect sensitive information, systems, and resources from potential misuse or data breaches. By promptly revoking credentials, organizations can ensure that former employees no longer have access to company assets, reducing the risk of insider threats and to maintain regulatory compliance. So how does a, how does a small business implement this CPG? Uh, first, identify who's responsible for disabling a, accounts and revoking credentials for departing or terminating employees. Establish a process for creating and disabling accounts for new temporary departing and, and terminate employees. And then delete and disable accounts for, for departing employees. Implement a timely revocation of a user's access to data an organizationally owned or managed applications infrastructure and network components at the time of termination of employment. It's very important. Uh, we don't have a resource uh, slide for this. Uh, this is one of the more, I guess you'd call self-explanatory ones. The key here is making sure that you disable and revoke accounts immediately after uh, employee departs your organization. All right, next slide, please. Our next CPG is to our system backups, and the requirement is the small business should secure data and reduce the likelihood and duration of data loss during loss of service delivery or operation. So how does this CPG relate to small business and why is it important? All right, system backups helps to prevent uh, data loss. Uh, regular backups protect against data loss due to hardware failure, cyber attacks, human errors, or natural disaster. Backups ensure that critical business information is not permanently lost. Also, system backups helps uh, restore corrupted data. If data becomes corrupted or compromised, backups allow the business to restore the data to a previous uncorrupted state. Also, for disaster recovery purposes, backups are a key component of disaster recovery plan, allowing the business to recover and continue operations even after a major incident. And lastly, uh, system backups help to reduce ransomware impacts. In the event of a ransomware attack, having up-to-date backups can allow the business to restore its systems without paying the ransom, saving money and reducing risk. All right, so what is required to implement the CPG? To fully implement the CPG, uh, applicants uh, should develop, test, document, and implement a process which ensures the replication of information to a redundant system, service, device, or medium, and has the ability to restore when needed. Um, all right. Uh, we also recommend um, to download and review the data backup uh, data backups option, which is available via CISA. Choose a backup method that suits your business, uh, that suits your small business to include, but not limited to full backups. Incremental backups, um, which is copying only changed data since the last backup, or differential backups, which is copying changed data since the last full backup. Use an alternate backups, uh, backup storage solution, such as external hard drives, network attached storage, cloud storage, or dedicated backup servers. 
ensure that the alternate storage site provides controls equivalent to that of the primary site. Automate backup processes to ensure regular and consistent backups without manual intervention. Test backups periodically to verify their integrity and ensure they can be restored. It's very important that they can be restored successfully in case of a data loss event. Uh, develop, document, and maintain a backup and recovery process. And this should include how to perform backup or recovery on critical assets, who's responsible for backup and recovery, how often uh, the backup and recovery is performed, uh, identify critical data applications and system configurations from your asset inventory that should be backed up regularly. Uh, before backing up systems, we suggest that um, the small business conducts vulnerability scans on systems and devices and addresses all known vulnerabilities. Small businesses should be able to copy information or process status to a redundant system, service, or device uh, medium, such as cloud, that can provide the needed processing capability um, when, when, it, when it's absolutely uh, needed and necessary. All right, uh, next slide. We have one last slide on system backups here that I'm gonna cover. Uh, again, this is training and resources and reference to the GCA toolkit. With that, I am going to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Jonathan, and he's going to start with the minimum password strength CPG. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Richard. Uh, okay. We're all doing good. We're going to make it. <laughs> all right. So to start off with, started off, we got requirements for minimum password strength. So the requirement is the small business should create and use complex passwords that are harder for threat actors to guess or to crack. How does this CPG relate to a small business? Well, one, protecting accounts. Strong passwords make it harder for attackers to brute force, reducing the risk of unauthorized access to sensitive business accounts and systems. It's uh, generally a disregard of vulnerability. So it's important to have a minimum password strength pass uh, policy because without it, employees are likely to use simple passwords such as Bobby123, which can be easily brute forced by threat actors. For example, in June 20, uh, 2021, New York City's law department fell victim to cyber attack that granted a uh, attackers access to sensitive information, including the personal data of thousands of city employees, evidence of police misconduct, medical records for plaintiffs, and the identities of children charged with serious crimes. And all that data was compromised using a single employee stolen password. Um, how does a small business implement? So develop and document a process for establishing complex passwords that are harder for threat actors to guess or crack. To fully implement minimum password strength, uh, you need to create unique passwords for all accounts, document, maintain, and enforce pa uh, password requirements for all employees, use a password manager to help you remember your passwords, do not write them down, and at a minimum, use eight character password for accounts using MFA, and for accounts not using MFA, use a 14 character password for accounts not. Um, so yeah, uh, longer pa passwords are preferred because uh, they are harder to crack than shorter passwords as they contain more characters, therefore more possible for combinations, more impossible for combinations for them to be uh, brute forced. So here's some training and resources along with uh, minimum password strength. Uh, next, 2H, phishing resistant multi-factor authentication. So the requirement, the small business should include additional layers of security to protect assets accounts whose uh, credentials have been compromised. So how does the CPG relate to the small business and why it's important? Um, for one, enhance security against phishing. Phishing resistance MFA, such as hardware tokens or biometric authentications, prevents attackers from easily gaining access to accounts, even if they obtain the user's password through phishing. Um, it prevents disruptions by securing access to critical systems and accounts. Phishing resist uh, and accounts phishing resistant MFA helps prevent uh, operational disruptions caused by unauthorized access or systems compromised due to phishing attacks. Uh, also, it supports remote working. MFA is especially important in environments where employees work remotely, as it ensures secure access to business systems from any location, reducing the risk of breaches in a dispersed workforce. Uh, so how do you implement it? To fully M implement MFA, develop, document, and implement the process for enabling and installing MFA. 
Here are some suggestions for implementing MFA. Applicants and awardees must decide the extent of security required to ensure critical assets are protected from unauthorized users if credentials are compromised. MFA should be implemented on an administrative access accounts on all business assets, whether it's managed on on-site or through a third-party provider. Also, uh, some uh, phishing-resistant MFA options to consider is like Google Authentication and Microsoft Authenticator. Uh, just as a side note, so SMS 2FA is not safe because it's vulnerable to spoofing, man-in-the-middle attacks, and phishing attacks, which uh, we don't recommend using if possible. I know there are some websites out there that they don't really support, you know, the standard for MFA. Uh, so, like I said, if possible. Uh, here's some more training and resources regarding phishing-resistant multi-factor authentication. Next, we have 2W, no exploitable services on the internet. So the requirement here is the small business should identify and monitor all assets, especially public facing assets, and ensure unauthorized users cannot gain an initial system foothold by exploiting known weaknesses. So how does it relate to a small business? Well, minimizing attack surface is for one. By not exposing services to the internet, the business reduces the number of entry points that attackers can use to breach systems. This makes it harder for cyber criminals to find and exploit vulnerabilities. Preventing common exploits. Services that are unnecessarily exposed to the internet can be targeted by automated attacks, such as those exploiting known vulnerabilities and outdated software. Uh, securing these services or removing public access helps prevent such exploits. For instance, in 2024, or in 2014, my apologies, hackers executed a successful cyber attack against Target. The attacker secretly gained access to Target's computer network through their HVAC system and stole the financial and personal information of 110 million Target customers, and then moved the sensitive information from Target's networks to a server in Eastern Europe. Very important. Uh, so how does a small business implement? First, develop and document a process to conduct vulnerability scanning, operate services exposed on internet accessible systems with secure configurations, keep software updated by installing and turning on automatic updates, and check all ports and verify all connections are authorized. If there are unused or open ports, secure them with port blockers. So here, uh, training and resources for um, no, no exploitable services on the internet. And next we have 2G, detection of unsuccessful automated login attempts. So requirement, the small business should protect its assets from automated credential-based attacks. Uh, uh, how does the CPG relate to a small business? Identifying brute force attacks. So automated login attempts are often part of brute force attacks where attackers try multiple usernames, and password combinations to gain access. Detecting these attempts early allows the business to respond uh, quickly before an account is compromised. Recognizing suspicious activity. So a high number of failed login attempts can indicate that someone is trying to breach the system. By monitoring and detecting these attempts, the business can identify suspicious activity and take action to secure accounts. Um, enforce account lockout policies. So Detecting failed login attempts allows the business to implement account lockout policies after a certain number of failures, uh, further protecting accounts from being compromised. So for example, in 2016, Uber suffered a major breach that exposed the personal information of 57 million users and drivers. The breach occurred when attackers accessed Uber's Amazon web, uh, web service, so ASW, by using uh, login credentials and found in a private GitHub resp uh, repository. Uber failed to detect the suspicious login attempts and did not have multi-factor authentication enabled, allowing attackers to exfiltrate sensitive data undetected. Uh, so how does the small business implement? So develop and document a process which prescribes a limit of consecutive law invalid logon attempts by a user. Uh, automatically lock the account for a period or lock the account until released by an administrator. Notify the cybersecurity leader and take other actions when the maximum number of unsuccessful attempts are, are exceeded. For example, Microsoft uh, Enterprise OS 
allows you to enforce a limit on a consecutive uh, invalid login attempts by utilizing Microsoft's uh, local security policy functionality to automatically lock an account after a preset limit of an invalid login attempts. Also, the local security policy manager allows you to detect login attempts with its uh, count logons events feature. You can see I have a little picture up there that shows exactly what that looks like. So here we have more training and resources regarding detection of unsuccessful login attempts. So next we have 2K, strong and agile encryption. So the requirement, small business should deploy effective encryption to maintain confidentiality and integrity of sensitive data being processed in transit or at rest. How, how does the CBG relate to the small business and why is it important? Evolving security needs. Agile encryption allows the business to adapt quickly to new security threats and technological changes by updating encryption protocols and practices as needed, uh, limiting damage. So in the event of a data breach, encrypted data is less valuable to attackers because it's unreadable without proper passwords or keys. This limits the potential damage and exposure for the business. Uh, strong and agile encryption is vital for protecting sensitive information and maintaining data confidentiality. It ensures that even if unauthorized parties gain access to encryption keys, the data is safe. So how does a small business implement the CPG? Develop and document a process to encrypt devices, removable media, such as like flash drives or, you know, uh, documents and files. Uh, use full disk encryption. So by encrypting all the data on the disk, including temporary files, programs, and system files. Um, so we we suggest using BitLocker since that's on every Windows computer. So um, three, properly configure email securities by updating transport layer security, which is otherwise known as TLS, to protect uh, data in transit and utilize AES, which is advanced encryption standard to uh, secure sensitive data at rest. Uh, four, implement additional layers of security, such as phishing-resistant multi-factor authentication to enhance overall uh, overall protection. So here we have more training resources that goes over strong and agile encryption. Next, we have 2M, email security. So requirement, the small business should reduce risk from common email-based threats, such as spoofing, phishing, and interception. How does this relate to a small business? Securing communication channels. Securing, uh, securing these channel or email security helps with ensuring that sensitive information is sent via email, such as uh, contracts, financial details, or personal details is protected from interception or unauthorized access. Enhanced verification. Advanced email security solutions often include features like uh, domain authentication, uh, to ensure that emails are coming from legitimate sources and reducing the risk of inner, uh, impersonations. Email security is a common target for cyber attacks due to its widespread use and potential for containing sensitive information. Email security is crucial for protecting against threats like data breaches, malware infections, financial fraud, and unauthorized access to confidential information. By implementing robust email security measures, organizations can safeguard their communication channels, maintain trust with customers and partners, comply with regulations and mitigate the risk associated with cyber threats and um, that target uh, emails. So for example, in 2018, the Federal Elections Commission, otherwise known as the FEC, fell victim to an email spoofing attack due to its lack of proper uh, email securities, including DMARC and TLS. Attackers sent spoofed emails that appeared to be from FEC officials to, uh, that, that seem to be from FEC uh, officials to various entities. So how does a small business implement the CBG? First, set up domain-based authentication reporting and conformance to protect your small business's domain name. Um, if stronger protection is required, then all internet-facing email services to be configured to enable start transport layer security, to encrypt emails in transit, enable sender policy framework, to prevent email spoofing and domain key identified mail to authenticate email integrity. And, uh, and all second level organization domains have domain-based authentication reporting 
and uh, conformance to reject unauthorized emails. So you can also check your current email services as many of these features may be available, such as like you, Yahoo, uh, Google offers uh, two-step verification for email accounts and a slew of other features. Recommend checking out the Gmail Help Center and check out all the security and privacy features that they have. Microsoft 365 offers all the features that I mentioned earlier within Outlook. So yeah, um, here's the training and resources regarding um, email security. <laughs> um, next, we have 2S, incident response plans. The requirement, the small business should develop, document, maintain, practice, and update cybersecurity incident response plans for re re uh, relevant threat scenarios. So how does the CBG relate to the small business and why is it important? Quick response. An incident response plan provides a stru structured approach to responding to incidents, allowing the business to act quickly and contain the situation before it escalates. This minimizes the impact on operations and reduces the potential uh, for data loss or system damage, reducing downtime. With a well-prepared uh, incident response plan, the business can restore normal operations by quickly, uh, uh, more quickly after an incident, minimizing downtime and its associated costs. Coordinated response. The plan ensures that all employees know their roles and responsibilities during an incident, leading to a more coordinated and effective response. Promoting a security culture, regular training and drills based on, on the incident response plan helps foster a culture of security awareness, ensuring that all employees understand the importance of their role in maintaining a cybersecurity. How do small businesses implement the CBG? So develop and document an incident response plan, which should identify the small business's high value assets, which should be listed in the asset inventory and are the most vulnerable, vulnerable assets identify threat scenarios that could have a severe negative impact to the SBIR slash SDTR small business. Should one or more assets be compromised in the event of a security incident? Define the security incident. So type criteria for what is reportable, acceptable timeline for reporting, uh, establish key stakeholder roles and responsibilities and communication slash escalation channels to share pertinent information of security incidents to include any mitigation measures taken, new vulnerabilities identified, risk accepted. Um, in addition, this information should be tracked and documented. Um, establish IR uh, or incident response objectives, and that includes predefined steps for detecting, analyzing, containing, and eradicating recovery and recovery from and reporting security incidents. Um, include the include process for reporting incidents for employees teleworking or uh, working remote. Test the IR plan to verify that it meets security requirements to protect the small business's asset. Conduct regular training and drills to ensure that employees are familiar with the IR plan, know their roles, and can respond effectively to incidents. Uh, the IR plan should include a form to identify the security incidents. So that's like date, time, location, individuals involved, contact information, descriptions of the incident and actions taken and made available for everyone within the small business. And this, this form should also be used in the incident reporting process as well. Also, just as a side note, check, check your current IT service provider as uh, coverage may be available to satisfy the CPG. So um, Microsoft has their own reporting system uh, as well as Google. So we recommend checking those. And next we have 4A, incident reporting. So the requirement, the small business should have security incident reporting procedures to contact incident response team and or senior ma uh, management in addition, the small business should have the CISA, FBI, or local police contact information available to assist or understand the broader scope of the cyber attack. So how does this relate to a small business? So coordinating with external parties. Reporting to authorities often requires the business to document and communicate the details or of the incident, which can help with uh, clarifying the situation and improve the overall incident response. 
engage uh, engaging industry networks. So reporting incidents can also connect the business with industry industry specific networks or information sharing organizations, providing valuable insight and support. Uh, access to government resources. So many governments like the uh, like CISA offer support to businesses that report cybersecurity incidents, including the technical assistance, including in technical assistance and legal advice. This can be crucial for small businesses that may lack internal resources. And last and not definitely not least, preventing uh, preventing wider harm. By reporting incidents, the business can help prevent further attacks on other entities. For example, if a small business is part of a supply chain, reporting an incident can alert other companies to the threat potentially protecting them from similar attacks. It's important to report actual or suspected security incidents immediately so that work can begin to investigate and resolve the incident. Reporting incidents that uncover system vulnerabilities should be analyzed by organizational personnel. The analysis can serve to prioritize and initiate mitigation actions to address the discovered system vulnerabilities. So how does a small business implement? Develop and document an incident, response, uh, incident reporting process as a minimum. The small business should utilize their incident response plan and develop incident reporting process objectives. The incident reporting process should identify personnel, personnel responsible for developing and updating on a yearly basis or when, or when that uh, process is needed. Other reasons, uh, other ways to implement, specifies when coordination is required for personnel to manage security incidents, addresses personnel tele teleworking and working remote, is disseminated or provided to all stakeholders, is tested and proven that the process meets the small business incident reporting objectives. Uh, incident reporting should be part of the IR plan and be made available for all personnel, identifies and assigns roles to key stakeholders, whether it's external or internal, response, uh, uh, responsible for reporting incidents to external incident res uh, response personnel to include organizational cybersecurity leaders, the small business owner, CISA, FBI, and local police. For example, you can report a cyber incident to CISA via their portal located on their website. Um, I, ha I have a picture on the bottom right corner of the screen. You can see, I put that there so you can see exactly what it looks like. Um, there, you can fill out a cyber incident report form. Uh, the portal is a secured platform with enhanced functionality for cyber incident reporting, including integrations with login.gov. So if you already have affiliations with the government, you can log in with those credentials. Uh, the, portal, the portal's enhanced functionality includes the ability to save and update reports, share submitted reports with colleagues or clients for third-party reporting, and search uh, and filter reports. It's a new collaboration feature which allows users to engage in informal discussions with CISA, which can be very helpful. For uh, further guidance, we recommend going and looking at their voluntary cyber incident uh, reporting resource. So here we have all the training and resources to go along with incident reporting. And I also have the link here uh, for places that you can um, report to. So, you know, CISA and the FBI, and yeah, and that's the end of my part. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to you, Flo. Okay, thank you, Richard and Jonathan for presenting the CPG guidance. I know that, that we went over a lot of information today. Um, so if you would like a, a review of the information, then I encourage you to visit the cybersecurity due diligence webpage. Um, I believe it's on the, the slide here. Um, we will have the implementation guidance posted um, probably no later than this Wednesday, the 25th of September, but probably sooner. Um, there's additional uh, resources and training on there that you can check out to help with cybersecurity and um, understanding the CPGs. Also, we'll, we also have a, uh, a feedback page. So I encourage you to get on there and uh, provide us your feedback so we can better assist you. Um, again, it's on our webpage. Um, 
that this pretty much concludes the uh, the guidance portion. Uh, we can begin the Q and A um, portion. So Zena, I don't know if you wanna. We have any other questions? I saw there was one question. <laughs> it, it was asking about the link. Uh, yes, so there is a question. It says, will regular user account with uh, sudo on uh, Apple, Mac, Linux, uh, safety 2.e? So user accounts with sudo on. Um, so may I ask how many uh, user accounts you have? I mean, these are some things that you would have to think about. Um, Do you see the question in the Q and A box? Yeah, I just asked. The, I was asking the uh, the person who asked the question um, the size of business of his uh, of his small business. Like, how many people are at your business, sir or ma'am? Okay, about uh, 20 people, but only three admin. Okay, um, I would have to, I would have to go and, and do a, a visit, but as far as um, looking at who has, um, if you have your access management set up correctly, um, I can see how this can satisfy 2E. Um, but again, I would have to go on site to validate that. So would you like uh, the person to send you an email? Yes, Ted, if you would like, you can send me uh, more information and we can have, I can provide more feedback to you. Wonderful. Would the person who asked the question again, uh, send an email directly to Florence? The email is on the on the screen. Uh, uh, please feel free to take a, a picture of the screen. Uh, this will help you get the information uh, uh, before uh, you know what we post uh, the, the slides uh, for you to access. Uh, the other question is, what are the critical CPGs? Uh, the web page is empty. Yeah, I apologize the web page is, is empty. Um, as I mentioned, the implementation guidance should be um, posted no later than the next Wednesday. And so the basically the critical CPGs are um, CPGs that were selected and that were prioritized to ensure that when you implement the CPGs that we address the correct scope and it's aligned with the business um, mission objectives. I use examples as um, the asset inventory. If you don't um, implement that CPG first, then how do we ensure that we are addressing the critical assets? So is Shabira, I'm sorry, is, does that make sense? Oh, wonderful. Um, uh, uh, since we are going to post this on a uh, website, we are not going to read uh, the names of the people. Okay. I'm sorry, yes. Please. Um, um, let me see. What are the key documentation and assessment that needs to be submitted as part of the follow-up phase two application? Could you please summarize and guide to uh, the appropriate uh, website? Um, okay, so I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question right but um, the cybersecurity requirement is to submit the SVIR, STTR, cybersecurity self-assessment uh, with the application by the application submission date. We have um, efforts currently ongoing to automate our self-assessment into PAMS, but until we are able to automate that into PAMS, this is the process. Are there any uh, funding opportunities for the SBIR or DOE to help small businesses implement the minimum requirements? So I've asked that same question. It's a very good question. Um, I believe that um, there should be a 
budget person that can assist, but I, I understanding that there is some funding that can be moved around to assist small businesses um, with, with this issue. Okay. okay, should this person send an email to you or? Um, does that answer your question? If not, please feel free. You've got my email address on the last slide there. Okay, thank you. Um, You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, we are going to stay for about five minutes to allow people to ask questions. Otherwise, we will end uh, today's webinar. Okay, we're just gonna wait and see. Okay, Flo, I don't see any more questions uh, submitted. Uh, oh, there is one. Where can we get the link to, the pre uh, to this presentation? Dina, I believe you are going to be sending this out to all the participants. Is this correct? And then once we get the recording, we'll be able to post this on the cybersecurity due diligence webpage. Okay, uh, that is correct. Uh, we will post uh, the uh, the recording and the presentation uh, on the cybersecurity webpage, and uh, also we can send an email to all the attendees uh, with the presentation. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, I don't see any more questions. I guess this will be it for us. Uh, thank you uh, to our uh, panelists for presenting and for our attendees. Like we, we mentioned earlier, we will uh, post the recording on uh, our website under the cybersecurity webpage. So please visit that webpage and look for uh, the recording to be posted there. It's going to take some time for us to uh, have access uh, to the recording, uh, but it should be posted uh, next week uh, on our website. And also, we will email you um, uh, the a copy of the presentation as soon as the list of attendees is available for us to access. Um, here's another question. We're going to answer that and then we will end our uh, webinar. For a less than five uh, people company, can the CPGs uh, largely be met by window uh, standard providers? Um, so that would be my first, um, that would be my first, uh, I guess, step in implementing the CPGs is to check to see if the service, but yes, most of these are just a, a security feature that should be enabled. Um, but again, you'd want to check with your cloud service provider on that. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, we come to the end of our webinar and um, have a good evening. Hey, thanks, Nina. You're welcome.